A corporation, according to the Pennsylvania State Legislature in 1834, remember that, Pennsylvania State Legislature, 1834, says a corporation is, quote, just what the Incorporation Act makes it. Quote, it is the creature of the law, the Declaration continued, and may be molded to any shape or for any purpose the legislature may deem most conducive for the common good. Now note well, that's the 1834 Pennsylvania State Legislature, hardly a bastion of socialists and anarchists. Corporations were strictly limited, in part because of the nature of American capitalism in the early 19th century. And it's proprietary capitalism, all right, not corporate capitalism. In the early 19th century, it is proprietary. Now there, if you thought about capitalism in the early 19th century, you're talking basically about the male freeholder, okay? The male artisan, the male farmer uh, who owns his workshop or his, or, his, uh, or his farm, okay? And he performs both mental and manual labor. Now that's important to understand here. An artisan or a farmer combines mental and manual labor. The prying apart of these two things is going to be central to the story. Now for males, and understand this, being a man in the early 19th century was bound up with owning property. To be a man in 1834, you had to own property. And also, I might add, to be really white in the early 19th century, you had to own property. Property was considered to be the basis of moral agency. You couldn't do anything unless you had property. So hence, white males were the center of legal notions of responsibility in the early 19th century. Now that conception of property and that conception of responsibility and personhood is what actually in a strange way underlies our notions of civil rights. In other words, the notion of civil rights itself is bound up with bourgeois notions of self-ownership and property, which is a fact that a lot of my friends on the left don't like to think about. So how did we get from the corporation as a legally created entity with strictly defined public goals and limitations to the corporation as a legal entity endowed with personhood and mandated only to enlarge shareholder equity? Well, part of the story revolves around the history of how that old proprietary model of capitalism broke down in the 19th century especially after the Civil War. Now, in their efforts to increase profits, right, that's what you're supposed to do if you're a capitalist. You are supposed to accumulate and increase profits. Capitalists, and especially merchants, realized that they had to use more advanced technologies, which meant that they had to get more control over their workers. Because in order to introduce this technology, what are you going to have to do? You are going to have to basically destroy old, artisanal, craft ways of life. And so these workers in your factories are going to resist you if you start introducing these technologies. Because to the extent that I introduce technology, I don't need you. You're going to resist me. The factory system, I think we have to remember, is not about the stuff. It's not about this building called a factory. The factory system is about disciplining workers and making their labor methodical. Right? If anybody has ever seen, for example, the classic movie by Charlie Chaplin, Modern Times, right? the famous scene where Charlie Chaplin is going through the wheels of the machine and he's doing things like this, constantly, constantly doing this for 14, 15 hours a day, right? That's the kind of thing that is involved with industrialized labor. You mechanize it. You routinize it, all right? But what does that require? You're not going to want anybody who exercises me mental labor doing this because, my God, you're going to get pretty bored after a while doing this. So what you do is you separate mental and manual labor. That's a shotgun divorce. And it creates what we know as the working class. All right? The working class does the manual labor. They stuff the machines. They tend the machines. Whereas 
the mental labor is now performed by professionals and managers. In other words, people like you. People who are, you are studying to be. The modern university system, by the way, is a result of this. Because you're all being trained to be professionals or managers, or most of you are, are being trained to be professionals and managers. In other words, to do the mental labor. Now notice, already we're starting to destroy those old proprietary notions about work and about responsibility. But that's only a part of the story. In order to get the capital that's required for investment in this technology, capitalists had to go outside the family circle. Because let's remember, in the early 19th century, most capitalist enterprises are either family businesses or they are limited partnerships. All right? But this meant, in order for them to get more capital and to go outside the family circle, you had to offer that thing called limited liability to investors and shareholders. So what do you have to do then? You have to separate ownership from daily control of the enterprise. How many of you have stock? How many of your parents own stock? If your parents own oil stock, the closest they ever come to oil is when they fill up their gas tanks. That's important because it implies that the people who own the business don't know a damn thing about it otherwise. All right? In other words, the separation of ownership and control is analogous to the separation of mental and manual labor. Notice what's going on here. Certain things are now being torn apart. All right. Now, this only further completely discombobulates the old proprietary order. For example, and some of my students have heard this question before, so be quiet. Who owns the car that rolls off the assembly line of General Motors? It's not the workers. It's not the engineers. It's not the executives. It's not even the shareholders individually. Who owns it? GM. In other words, General Motors owns the car, not a physical entity at all. So much for materialism is the greatest evil of capitalism. A legal fiction owns those cars. That's weird. But I'm getting a little ahead of the story. The corporation was a legal as well as an economic entity. And so we have to look briefly at this whole ensemble of federal and state court decisions that comprised what really, in a, in a sense, amounts to a Copernican revolution in business law. Now, recall that, that the center of that old capitalist universe had been the male proprietor, right, holding his plow or his hammer in his thick, calloused hands, right? Now, by the 1870s and 1880s, this very simply was not the way most industrial labor was being performed. The emerging conditions of corporate capitalism were placing an emphasis on the interdependence of people, not the independence of people. Now, a lot of judges and economists and business journalists saw this reality. And they were arguing, basically, that we had to change the nature of the way that we thought about capitalism. In other words, they were talking about what we would call the new economy of the late 19th century. And so in a series of court decisions that stretched over the 1880s to about the 1920s, federal and state courts, but especially the Supreme Court, extended to corporations the legal status of a person with the meaning of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. At first to their stockholders and then to the corporation itself as this entity, the Supreme Court bestowed the rights and privileges it had originally ascribed to proprietors and protected these new entities against deprivation of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. In effect, to the limited liability of the stockholder was added the limited liability of the corporation in the face of the power of government. Now, the important uh, cases here are, first of all, the Santa Clara case of 1886, which defined the corporation as a person. Right? The Supreme Court in the Santa Clara case said, 
basically, the corporation has rights just like you or me, flesh and blood people. And the other bookend is a 1919 Michigan Supreme Court case entitled Dodge versus Ford Motor Company, which set the standard of shareholder primacy right, as the criterion of corporate performance. 